Hey there, I'm Pumzile Sutole. You may remember me as General Doye on Star Trek Discovery, and you're listening to Trek Untold. Hello and welcome to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. Today, Trek Untold goes international as we chat with a guest all the way across the globe in South Africa. Joining us today is Pumzile Sitole, a performer whose Star Trek fans will recognize as General Ndoye of the United Earth Defense Force from the third and fourth seasons of Star Trek Discovery. During her six appearances on the show, she had the chance to work with Sonequa Martin-Green, Doug Jones, David Ajala, and hang out with the entire cast and crew, including one very special person who showed up towards the end of the fourth season, and you know who I'm talking about. Beyond Star Trek, Pumzale has worked on stage and screen a ton in her home country, which we're going to discuss a bit today, but American viewers might remember her as Sharice from The Good Fight, or her time on Orange is the New Black and Elementary. I don't get a chance to speak with folks who live on other continents that often, so when I do, it's always a very special occasion. I doubt we've seen the last of General Ndoye on Discovery, so why not get to know the woman behind that very awesome uniform and occasional cape accessory while we eagerly await season five of the show? With that said, let's sit back, turn on our 32nd century hollow emitters, and enjoy this conversation with a delightful and engaging Pumzale Sitole. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash trekuntold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe you want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And now joining us from all the way in beautiful South Africa, you know her as a certain authority figure in a certain show, because that's right, folks, we're talking to Metro Cop herself. We have Pumzile Satoli. <laughs> Pumi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, Matthew. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm coming in hot with the Metro Cop references. That was like one of the first things I found on YouTube with your name on it. Oh my gosh. I really thought you were just like nicknaming Ndoye. I was like, what? How did you find that? I can't delete that video. Wow. <laughs> That is so embarrassing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I'm starting this thing off with the most embarrassing thing on your resume, I guess, but that's that's fine. Um, you got a lot more other things to talk about too besides that. But Metro Cop is a thing, <laughs> folks. So it is a thing. It is please don't go look it up. It is a thing. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't give it any more views beyond we've just given it right here. Um, no, so please. Yeah, so Pumi, thank you so much uh, for being able to do this. And right now, like we mentioned, you're in South Africa, which is like I'm sure lovely and uh, nice weather out there. And I'm here in New York where it's like twenty eight degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Oh, gosh, no, it's 28 degrees Celsius. Yeah, so it's very nice and warm. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> jealous right now. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we got a lot to talk about here. And I, I got to tell you, Pumi, like your, your name has actually been one that's been on my radar since season three oh, of Discovery, because really? I actually found like some behind the scenes photos you shot on set. 
And I was like, cool, oh, cool. I got to talk to her. And then here you are season four and you're back in such a big way. So that's, that's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I didn't expect to be back. So it was a nice surprise to get the call from my agents. All right. So Pumi, let's go ahead and uh, jump on into things here. And uh, I'm very curious to hear your answer to this question. This is how I start all my interviews. Uh, and I'd okay. like to know, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Did you watch it as a kid growing up in South Africa? Oh my gosh. So no, but I do remember hearing about it. Um, I was the kind of kid that was not necessarily in front of the TV. I was a dancer and like mover. So I just, TVs, and I don't have many TV recollections from when I was young, but I definitely do recall hearing about Star Trek and Star Wars. And I would often confuse them, which I know is absolutely just like profanity. So I apologize for offending every Trekkie out there. But um, yeah, I don't really have an early memory of it from when I was a kid, because as I say, I was I was on the streets <laughs> and running, running a mock um, more so than watching much TV. But yeah, so I feel like my first encounter of it was when I was um, a lot older and um, actually close to when I got this um, audition. So that was most most of my introduction was when I started working with it. And then I fell in love with it quite, quite a bit. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about that, because I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, where you grew up, uh, who your parents are, what they did. Uh, and especially what little Pumi wanted to be when she grew up. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, so I, yeah, so I'm from South Africa, from Johannesburg. Um, I was born in Soweto, but I grew up actually in the Burbs um, here in Ravonia. Both my parents were um, amazing human beings. My dad um, worked in HR. My mom was a chef. Um, so you kind of had a very business minded and artist um, you know, couple. And from when I was four, I started dance school. So they always knew that there was a performer in me of sorts. Um, and they really celebrated that and gave me the room to like explore that. And um, yeah, they really nurtured my artistic side. My brother's also an artist, my sister's a photographer. So they weren't afraid of their kids following um, a career in the arts at all. And, and yeah, so yeah, that was kind of my, my, my roots, my, I think I answered the question. <laughs> so when did acting kind of first come into this? I mean, you mentioned dancing. Was that like what you were looking towards doing professionally? I was. And then I feel like I heard, like I just had the realization. So if I like hurt my ankle or break my leg, I can't have a career. And I think that just frightened me. Um, so I went, um, I think acting took the forefront when I changed schools and went to a school that allowed me to do my home language, Isizulu, as a matric subject, which is like last year of high school. I don't know what you guys call it, but yeah, so it allowed me to do that and it allowed me to do drama as a matric subject, which I really wanted to do. And my mom like worked really hard to be able to afford that school. It's called St. Mary's here in Johannesburg. Um, and then after that, I found a great drama teacher who was like, you should go to this university in Cape Town, which has one of the best drama schools in Africa, which is where I went. And then after that, I applied for grad school. And I know at some point you went to, I think, NYU, right? Was that grad school for you? Columbia. That was Columbia. Okay, Columbia. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that was grad school. Exactly. So that's that's where I was my introduction to kind of America. And yeah, I've been there for close to nine years now since I started at Columbia. Well, I've got to ask, I mean, you're living in South Africa. What made you want to come all the way to New York to study acting? I want to say Broadway, literally just that word, not necessarily what it is, but the word Broadway. I'm a, I'm a theater actor, to be honest. Like that is my comfort zone. That is my playground. That is my, it's where my imagination feels the most like, rah, which is why being in space also like activates that. But so yeah, I, I just wanted to to be, like find the world stages and, and that's what I was pursuing. One of the others was London was a big target of mine. So yeah, it just ended up being America because of Broadway and also different grad schools that I was applying to at the time. It just made more sense to do the MFA um, in the States versus the UK. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I was gunning for, really just Broadway. I didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> and now I'm like, I'm not really a musical theater kid. So it's not really the real Broadway that I was after, but yeah. 
Well, that's really interesting. I'm a New Yorker myself also, so I totally get what you mean here. Uh, but I'd yeah, like to hear a little bit you know, about what your experience is like coming to uh, America, because you're basically leaving home behind, you're coming to a different land entirely. Uh, and, you know, we should preface this too for folks that don't know or might be ignorant of it. It's not like, you know, South Africa is some strange little desert world. Like, you know, it's uh, especially Joburg and Cape Town. These are like, yeah. you know, metropolitan areas. But still, you know, you're coming from one met metropolitan area to a very different type of metropolitan area. So was there like any kind of a culture shock for you? You know, not really. I, I, you know, I keep saying to people like we so are saturated with American media and movies and TV shows that it literally what I kept saying to people when I first got to New York, I was like, it looks like the movies. Like <laughs> the only thing I was disappointed about was the Statue of Liberty. She looks so much smaller in real life than I thought she was. I thought she was like towering over New York. And I'm like, you got to go find her. She's like, yay hi. <laughs> um, but outside of that, it just I felt so it felt very familiar. The yellow cabs the Times square felt familiar like everything just you know it, it wasn't a big culture shock for me the subway was but outside of that like everything else you're right I'm from a, I'm from a city so people think coming from Africa I'd be like but no I was just like I know this from tv I get it let me get used to the dollar and let me get used to the subway and let's go <laughs> That's very cool. And, you know, I got to tell you, you know, most of the actors we've spoken to who have done Discovery are from Canada. So uh, it's kind of yeah. refreshing and nice to be able to talk about a very different location, because I think really this is the first <laughs> time uh, someone I've talked to has not been from Canada on Discovery. So uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I don't think there's been really any Americans I've talked to from the show. So, um, you know, I hope you don't I'm going to probably hit you up with a lot of questions about your, your home country, because uh, I am very interested okay. in it. And, uh, happy to talk to them <laughs> thank you and i would like to actually know a little bit about like what the entertainment scene is like over there because i know uh, you have done some okay. theater there in fact i know you did um the show called if, if pretty hurts ugly must be a motherfucker there's a lot of youtube videos in that uh yeah like, that you know, was in new york that was in new york though but yes okay um i, know, I think you did something in in uh in antigone also in south africa right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i guess i'd kind of like to hear what the the theater scene is like let's kind of start there because uh, I've, I've spoken sure. to folks from other places who have performed in different countries and they tell me like you know audiences can be different reactions can be different so uh, okay. i guess just kind of talk to me a little bit about what the the theater scene is like in south africa absolutely um so i'm a big advocate of all of our, our actors and our stories and i you know i really feel it was a really hard decision to to leave what I grew up and 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 how I learned acting is really the root of who I am as an actor is really in the soil in my country and I just mean that in a sense that we're I'm from a very devised theater school of thought so we do a lot of work with our bodies physical theater we do a lot of work with song we do a lot of work with just like not just only text-based material um, which I really, really love. And so, I, I mean, our work has has all of that included, you know, I mean, I, I've, I did, um, I, like I said, I went to the University of Cape Town, and there I did acting in both um, English and Iskosa, which is one of our languages. And I just, I find this just a, a beautiful freedom in that because you find that with storytelling that isn't a different language, you have to use your body, you have to use song because you know not everyone in the audience will be speaking that language. And, and to be able to be that kind of communicator has just gone into my acting in so many different ways. I think it, it helps me tell stories without words um, better than I think I, I would have without that kind of um, homegrown yeah way of of approaching acting and storytelling um but yeah i i our, our theater one of our major theaters market theater here in johannesburg was one of my first jobs and i felt really privileged to to do anything on that stage um and then we have a very big festival called the national arts festival in grahamstown and worked in in both of those and yeah, I, I, my, my favorite actors are South African actors. <laughs> um, so whenever I'm asked that question, I'm like, you're not going to know her. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I, I very much respect our, our storytellers. And um, I very much want to be able to work bicontinentally um, as my career progresses. Yeah. I liked what you said about telling stories without words, because that's very much like a classical approach to doing theater. I mean, 
even if you look at like Shakespearean theater, they are still saying these very flowery prose words, but on stage, the productions were meant to be very big and kind of uh, large movements, that kind of thing, because you still had to reach the people who might not necessarily understand what the words were either. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about, uh, I guess, some of the stuff that you learned in those formative years of you coming up as an actor and performing. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe mm -hmm. something you learned on stage during a production or something you learned from a teacher uh, that you mm -hmm. continue to use to this day in your career. That's a very good question. I think, uh, I, and I think a lot of other actors use this, but one big thing, um, a, a teacher of mine at UCT who headed up the Kosa side of the acting department, his name is um, Bukman Lambot, where he taught, he, a lot of our shows we do barefoot. And there was something about the rooting of your character and who you are through the ground and through your feet. And um, since then, which I've heard other actors adopt, adopt as well, you don't really, for me, find the character unless you find what's on their feet or what their feet are doing. And I remember saying to Gersha Phillips when she showed me Ndoya's shoes, it, it rooted her in such a different way. And I don't know if that's from from what my training has been from home, it's, it's how you stand and what shoes you're in is literally, you know, when they say like walk a mile in my shoes is literally what helps me identify with the character more than anything. So I feel like that's one thing that feels very important to me. And, and if I can do a theater show without shoes on, I am in absolute heaven and bliss because it just feels, it just feels like such a direct connection to, ancestors to be honest to like the history of so many people before um which is it's just a very I guess I want to say African South African um storytelling necessity um so yeah I feel like the the feet the shoes um make are a big deal for me when it comes to attaching and, and finding a character that's very fascinating because you know a lot of times we've, we've spoken to people and in general I feel like you know actors they say they won't find their character until they put on their costume. But for you, it's about just kind of literally touching it and physically having this tactile sensation of becoming that person. Exactly, exactly. Shoes for me, it's like the sooner I can get those shoes on and walk, literally, um, the more I, the, the sooner I, I can feel at home in the character. And a little bit earlier, too, you did mention that there were some South African performers who you really admired. And uh, you said we wouldn't know them, but I don't care. I want to hear them. Anyway. Let's, let's name some names. <laughs> who, who are some folks that you liked that inspired you? And, and same, I'm too, if there were any Americans also or any British actors, anything like that. You know, who are the folks that got you to want to act? Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like number one there would be... Um, a lady called Sibulele Tulijana. She's an incredible um, actress. Um, she was actually in the play that I did at the Market Theatre that also went to the National Arts Festival. That's how I met her, but I knew of her before. Um, we also have Sisfani Swayiswa, who I absolutely love. Um, but both, I think, of those women have taught me so much about yeah, I feel like with acting, which I'm still learning to do, is like about forgetting yourself, but also bringing the parts of yourself that aid the character to the forefront as well. And they just have a way of, of, of executing that so brilliantly. And I, they, I also love them because they're not afraid to get ugly. You know, I think so much of acting, especially when it comes to camera, which I'm learning is you, it feels a little self-conscious, but those are two women that I find aren't afraid to get ugly, let their faces mush up, let their bodies slump that women don't sit like, you know, I just like, I, I thrive watching both of them perform um, and, and they inspire me hugely. Um, I'm also a big fan of Tusum Bedu, who I'm sure you guys are very much hearing more and more about because she is, um, she's a South African actor who was just in Barry Jenkins' Underground Railroad. And she's another one, not afraid to get ugly, just a, a really grounded, incredible performer. Um, there are men out there as well, but I feel like those three women, I definitely are my, are my heart and my spirit as, as actors I look up to. It kind of reminds me of something that I hear a lot in animation that we've heard in animation for, for many, many years. And that's like when animators are drawing women, they're always afraid to make them ugly. They're always afraid to like make their faces be really expressive. So that's kind of interesting that you're bringing that up. Oh, wow. I never heard that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like your, it's like your body has to be held in a certain way, which is kind of sensual. No, I can sit like a man. I can make my face growl, you know, and I think the, 
actors that do that that allow themselves to to get weird are, are right up my alley <laughs> very cool yeah. uh, do you remember what your first professional gig was in acting i think it's it was that market theater play was it i have to think yeah it was and that was a that was a, a tricky play on many fronts it was called littlefoot um but it, it was an interesting experience. I'll say that <laughs> it taught me a lot. Um, but that that would have been my first one outside of of university. Uh, yeah, that was my first. Well, what did you learn from that one? I mean, that that sounds like it's always got to be the thing. Your first one's always the one that like sets the tone. So, I mean, what did you learn from your time in that production? Um, I learned that my parents weren't ready to see me make out on stage. <laughs> My dad I don't think anybody's art to this day, reaction. right? I know. <laughs> um, they had quite a visceral reaction that I heard on stage as well, and I couldn't help but laugh on stage. Um, no, I think I learned... <sighs> I learned how to be professional. You know, I think that different theater TV shows come with different directors or experiences or scripts that you that may not necessarily gel with how you want to be doing things. And I think that you realize as an actor, I think my favorite people to work with are actors that realize that there's too many other factors going into making this happen. Just do your job, just be a decent human being and we can all get this ship moving. The minute you are the one that's resisting or like this sucks or this sucks, you know, the whole thing slows down and kind of becomes even harder. Um, so I think it's really important to actually put yourself and your opinions on something to the side in order to keep the thing moving. And that show taught me that because I had a lot of opinions, <laughs> but I was definitely in the world of like, this is my first ever thing on my favorite stage. So who am I to even think twice, except to be like really keen and, you know. Um, so yeah, taught me to be professional or what professionalism looks like. And what was your first big break in America? Would that have been uh, The Good Fight? Yeah, that was my first. That was my first. Oh gosh, that was, that was crazy because I auditioned for that on a Monday and I was on set on a Wednesday. So I was I was full panic mode. And then I found out my only scene partner was Delroy, Delroy Lindo, who I look up to so much. And I was like, wait, I'm going to do my first TV show. And he, he said, oh, in two days. Oh. I was very panicked, but it was such a lovely set. And everyone was very kind and very welcoming. And I think the one thing I feel about a lot of the sets that I've gotten to work on is that they're very um, supportive and if you need help ask and they are happy to help because as I was saying you're one little you know nugget in such a big machine so they want to be able to like make that nugget move so you know help and support is always there and um, that that first experience was very pleasant because of that they were very generous. And you're also making the transition from stage to television too, which is kind of different as well. Like it's, it's a whole different ball game, right? Absolutely different ball game. And I was actually very lucky that even though I had work on the Wednesday so soon after I booked it, that my first day on set was actually, I'm so sorry. My first day on set was you actually- episode, Trek and Tolf wasn't a dog barking. It's all good. It was, it's my dog, Ollie. I don't, I don't know what she's barking at. Um, my first day on set, luckily it wasn't my line scene. It was with my scene partner, but I wasn't speaking yet. So I got to just watch and watch where marks are and watch that I had a whole first first team and second team. That's There's someone my height who stands in my place while they light it, while I get to sit down and wait. It was, it was fascinating for me. I just literally spent the whole day just watching how how it works because i'd never done it before now as you're doing these shows too in america you're putting on an american accent and as we hear you talking right now you have a south african accent it's a very distinct kind of accent uh you know, i think it's like part dutch part it's all sorts of different places that it comes from um mm -hmm. so i'd like to hear you know what it's like for you to have to basically change that accent i mean has that been difficult for you to do uh, it used to be worse it's gotten a lot better um I wouldn't say difficult in the sense that we hear it so much, similar to how I felt when I first got to New York. It's it's so the accent's so familiar to us. We hear it in so many movies and TV shows. So I think what is still a challenge for me and what was a challenge is where in America. 
<laughs> so I just kind of shoot for a region and hope I land somewhere, somewhere safely. Um, but yeah, I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos. I'll like find a character archetype from the place that my character's from. And I'll just like YouTube, YouTube, podcast, podcast, YouTube, podcast. Um, so yeah, I think it's gotten better over time, but in the beginning, it was a little intimidating. I feel like I'd just arrive on set and just be like doing some sort of American accent in the hopes that like I would just stay in it as much as possible. Yeah, that's got to be yeah. difficult too, to try and be authentic sounding because uh, there's so many strange dialects we have here. I'd imagine that are probably difficult for, for someone outside of the country to learn. I mean, I imagine all the different stuff that's in totally. the South, especially. Totally. And it's hard to like pick up on those differences. I can hear them vocalizing those differences is so much more nuanced so i mean I, I hear the south african accent is the hardest thing to do and i believe it because it's like we have 11 official languages like good luck <laughs> yeah, i'd love to hear what, what your new york accent is because even i like i don't even i don't even like my own accent it's like new york and coffee and uh, all those things you know like it just it's so rough. <laughs> yeah I'm, i don't even want to attempt it <laughs> Now, you have uh, one of, I think, the more interesting indirect Star Trek connections in your career, too, because you were on Orange is the New Black, and uh, you got yeah. to work with none other than Captain Janeway herself, Kate Mulgrew, uh, and in that show, you were uh, you were Antoinette Curson Ackers on the show uh, for the last two seasons, I believe, of the show, uh, and, like, what a show yeah. that you get to, that to be a part of. Like, you know, I've, I haven't really watched much of it, but I got to do some research and watching you in the episodes mm -hmm. for this podcast, and, like, I kind of want to watch the show now. It's a really cool show, but... Um, the right. point is, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experiences there and uh, especially working with Kate Mulgrew. Oh, it was so, 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 so lovely. I mean, it was it was funny going from the good fight where I'm in heels and like these like gorgeous clothes and gorgeous makeup and lots of time in hair and makeup to going to a prison where they don't put any makeup on you. They just do corners like I have now with my own hair and they throw you in these slacks. <laughs> It's like it was it was really fascinating and we also worked in an actual prison was one of our sets so that was really um a little challenging but really important for me I think I I have quite a an an interest and commitment in general to incarcerated youth so to get to be in, a, in an active prison as well it wasn't like it wasn't working there were actual prisoners two floors above where we're shooting that some of the times would pass them in the hallways which felt real muddy being like I'm in costume prisoner there you are real life prisoner so I learned a lot I think um emotionally on that show um but working with Kate was exceptional I always used to say one thing as a theater actor I'd come in I'd know my lines I'm ready to go and you know they always give us little signs that you take on set and your first thing you do is you read the scene rehearsal and then you block it and then you shoot so I had to get used to bringing my sides to this read because I was like, I know my lines, but like, I don't want to be too eager. <laughs> so I just like read with everyone. But Kate and Uzo also feel like theater actors. They just got there. They knew their lines. They're on voice. They're, she's not holding a script. She's just, you know, doing. And she's playing from the jump, from the rehearsal. She's in it. And I think that gave me the freedom to be like, actually, I don't need to fall back into this, like, who kid let me like you know I I know my lines and I know what choices I want to start trying out and I think working with Kate really showed me that and I know she was at a different echelon at that point so and she had been working on the show so maybe she was really comfortable in that saying and I'm not saying anything to actors that want to bring scripts but I definitely looked up to her in those moments to be like let's just play we're here to play and we're actors let's go <laughs> um so working with her was really great in that sense and i'm happy that you mentioned uh, uzo duba because like i wish that she did star trek because i want an excuse to talk to her because she's so good right, right? right? yeah and, and I, I, yeah, just again the few clips i watch of her is crazy eyes I'm like wow like I, you know I, to be honest like my first knowledge of her came from steven universe cartoon show here uh, and then i kind yeah. of start seeing her other things and like just watching her in orange is new black I'm like wow she's amazing Right? She's truly, and such lovely people, like really, really kind people. Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. 
Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, a Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section, where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Have you ever watched a YouTube video and said you wish you could do what they were doing? Whether it's the filming, the production, the editing. Maybe you listen to your favorite podcast and you wondered how they put that show together, how they got that great sound quality, what gear they used. How much does it cost to get started? Or maybe you checked out a video or read a book about one of your favorite entrepreneurs and it made you say, I want to live that life. I want to do what they do. Then check out my podcast, Toys and Tech of the Trade. I'm Rich Butler and I've been making podcasts for almost two decades, speaking with experts across all fields to get to the bottom of the hows and whys of their achievements. Each week I sit down with these amazing people who have carved their own path in life and share the gadgets, the gear, and the tech that they rely on to create their content, the methods that they use to run their business, and the habits and trends that are part of their daily routine and their way of life. And all of that, of course, gets put together to make them successful. We pull back the curtain on the process to help you understand what these people do differently so that you can draw inspiration and get ideas and be inspired so that you can take action today. This podcast is inspiring, educational, it's enlightening, And most of all, it's a lot of fun. I want you to join me on this journey so that you can use the tools and advice shared in this podcast to level up your business or creative endeavors, giving you all the tips, tactics, and tools so that you can transform what you're doing from a side hustle into a full-time lifestyle where you can collect a paycheck for doing what you love. Check out Toys and Tech of the Trade wherever you listen to podcasts and check out the RageWorks Network at RageWorksNetwork.com for more info on this podcast and all of the many other great shows that we have on the RageWorks Podcast Network. That's Toys and Tech of the Trade with some assembly required. All right, so Pumi, let us beam into our Star Trek discussion now. So you first appeared as General Nadoye in Star Trek Discovery Season 3. You returned again for the latter half of season two. So let's start at the very beginning of your journey into Star Trek. Now, tell us about your very first audition for the show. And did you actually know you were auditioning for a Star Trek show? I did know I was auditioning for a Star Trek show, but it was my first audition that it was so top secret that you can't even, I don't know if they told you this, the actors, you can't download the sides or print the sides because like if it sees that you screenshot it like self-combust or something so it was my first that I was like gosh they wouldn't even give me sides at the audition I think they had them to like show to you but you can't have the script um so that was a little like what is this show um and yeah it was it was a lovely audition it was a great room it was actually at the CBS offices in New York so it was my first time going to to those um I think his name is Rob Cena. It was a really kind guy. Um, read with him, felt very confident, and yeah, it felt it felt really natural. 
Uh, your first scene in the series is a pretty big one. I mean, you talked about the good fight just being your first, uh, doing your first scene with Delroy Lindo, and here you are in your first scene of Discovery, and it's with Sonequa Martin Green and Doug Jones. So yeah. you are literally thrown <laughs> into things with the two leads right away. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, they are, I'm sure you've heard, the nicest people in the world. And Sonequa is the, she's the best person to be number one on the call sheets and literal captain of the ship. Like she actually sets the tone on set and it's one of like incredible humility and kindness and generosity. So you just can't go in there and, and be a not nice person. You actually just can't, it's impossible. <laughs> so she, yeah, it, it was a very kind and welcoming environment from the jump with both of them. Now, what was it like your first time actually seeing the Discovery set too? Because that's also, I, I gotta imagine, be pretty different to see than what you're used to on, on any other shows you've worked on, right? It was so cool. I literally was like jaw on the ground, walk, seeing the bridge for the first time. My mind was actually blown. I was also just like, how does it even fit you? Like, it's actually big. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it's as big as it looks on TV. And I'm like, wow. Um, between seeing the set for the first time and seeing Doug's space, of course, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't stop. A poor guy. He just let me like touch touch it the whole day because I was just like the detail it is profoundly incredible just to like look at his prosthetics I'm like I was obsessed <laughs> yeah it's like you want to talk about folks who get lost in their roles I mean for folks who do like the heavy prosthetics like Doug Jones like once they put that makeup on they're gone right so I, I've always I've always wanted to know this I've talked to folks who've worked with Doug plenty times but uh, let's hear from your perspective I mean when you see Doug on set how much of it is actually still Doug and how much of it is just him being Saru walking around like that I find the similarities between Doug and Saru are, are intense. That that kind, generous, like person, <laughs> like that Saru is, is who Doug is. So like, I find like, I feel like with Doug, he just has a different sense of humor and like, he's a lot more like chill and like, you know, poking fun and like of anything. But I feel like that that same like, sweet nature of a person that Saru is I mean that Doug is is who Saru is so um I won't lie I feel like the first time I saw Doug because I actually mostly when I first worked with him only saw prosthetics when I first saw him I was like oh my gosh <laughs> um it had it's it still takes some adjusting because I feel like who I know Doug to be is him in Saru's prosthetics because that's the person I spend the most time with <laughs> offset more than I do with Doug the actor if that makes sense that does that does for sure yeah I've, I've heard that experience from other people too <laughs> yeah yeah I think uh I think it was the episode that you did on season three that was also the first one to introduce uh Blue Del Barrio's character uh which has yes. been a pretty big one in season four as well uh so I'd love to hear also you know I don't think you got, really got to do a ton of things with Blue but uh just working mm -hmm. with Blue being around Blue what's that like Oh, she's incredible. She, when I was um, in Toronto the first time, she helped me with a, a couple of auditions and she's just so sweet and so down to earth. She had just come from London, I think, she, where she had just finished studying. So it was like also one of her first jobs, if I'm not uh, mistaken. So I think she was just also that like keenness to learn and that like humility and that everyone on set seems to have. And really just a dope person and I think you know we had that connection because I dropped her off because she was on my ship I mean she was you know on my team as as working with with earth um so it, it did feel like a a natural like um mentor mentee thing even though we were both learning but it was it was that for a second and and now she's gone on to be incredible in it now, that was basically kind of season three in a nutshell there. It's not like, you know, as a robust of role as season four, but that's what I'd actually like to hear about now is, you know, at that point, season three, I, I think you would imagine that was just your role and you're going to move on. Uh, but exactly. when did you hear you were coming back for season four? I heard, I want to say around the end of 2020. So that's, yeah. And we, yeah, I was only on set again April, May 2021. But yeah, by the end of 2020, 
they'd said they wanted me for one episode in season four and then a week later called back and were like actually five episodes of season four and I was like oh well that's a big difference sure um so yeah that's when I first heard that they wanted me back and you know you are filming this during COVID-19 pandemic too so I imagine like everything is very different how the set is run is very different so uh you know kind of talk to me a little bit about what the set was like season three versus here we are season four where we've got a phone blown pandemic to deal with yeah you know the same outside of the masks and the testing you know it was and and the hugs I feel like <laughs> season three was very like hi everyone and then there was like no hugging which felt very weird um but I feel like it was it was the same I think we just got so used to it I think the only thing that was tricky was these like two week quarantine period so I I remember I did three of those which was really hard to do in isolation in Canada the first one was when I first arrived and then the second one was um when there was a, a, a positive case that I was the only um main actor who was around so I had to go into quarantine with the producers were so sweet about it they sent me like a care package with like treats and cheese and snacks and they were like so sorry we miss you already um and then the third one I had I had flown to New York for something and when I get back so it was like those were the really hard chunks to do um over the season four shooting I think COVID wise that was that was tough we talked earlier about the feeling of being in the shoes of literally walking in someone else's shoes and here you are in Star Trek walking in the shoes of General Nadoye uh, so mm -hmm. let's talk about your wardrobe because you do have a pretty different costume from season one, season two. I mean, you got a cape in season two, uh, which is I got a cape. <laughs> it's really nice too. The hat was cool. I mean, it's such a different outfit. It's really fun. Um, so yeah, yeah, tell us about the outfits. I mean, were they comfortable to wear? That's probably the most important thing. Was were they comfortable to wear, and did you like them? Oh, I love them. I love them both. I think Osha Phillips is an actual genius. I, she is so specific the way she makes you stand for like close to an hour, an hour and a bit. Not that it's like she makes you, but you also want to because she is so meticulous about like every corner and it's it's, I mean, that whole team that worked on it, it wasn't, you know, just Gersha, um, was really incredible. So they they made me fall in love with it even more. Um, but yeah, I was very excited when I saw my cape. Very. Talk about something that changes your walk. That made me walk even differently. Like, just, I just felt like I went from captain to general. <laughs> So a lot of the scenes that you did in season four were also kind of you just doing things alone because you are spending a lot of time, you know, as far as the show looks, speaking back and forth with David Ajala. Uh, you do have a few mm -hmm. scenes with him, but for a lot of it, uh, towards the end of the season especially, you're just basically communicating back and forth. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about working with David uh, and also just the fact that so many of your scenes are you kind of monologuing in a way, you know, like, was that a challenge for you? Um, no, not really, just because I was so in the world of the of of the universe you know and you also have someone reading the lines for you so there's never a moment where I have to imagine what's being said I'm actually hearing it so um in that sense it didn't feel like monologuing David is an actual he's an he's an alien he's an actual alien because he is such an incredible human being he he taught me so much our, our our scene where we had a bit of a fight scene was really challenging for me but he was so supportive and so incredible um and he's just great and funny and down to earth and yeah it was it was really incredible working with him now i did make a joke like at the very start of the show about metro cop but really the reason i wanted to bring that up was just because you know <laughs> i was looking up things and i saw that as like the first authority figure i saw you doing um, so I'd yeah. love to kind of hear a little, a little bit about where the character of General Nadoye comes from. I mean, who is she? Where does she get her stance? Where does she get her physicality? Uh, where does she get her mental state? Mm. Oh, she comes from the script, obviously. But like, truly, when I say that, I just mean I feel like she was written very clearly. It was it was something that was said to me, um, which might be of interest to you, was was that they really struggled to find the actor to play this part and they looked for quite a while um Alex Kurtzman was was had said to my my reps that finding me was quite a was, was a tough thing um and I think for many reasons and you know they there was a worry when I first got on set in season three that I was too young for her you know as this leader as this woman but when they'd watch me play her it 
it, you could feel her like authority ness. And I think that in general, as me, comes a lot from from my dad in a sense. I think he, you know, watching him growing up as as uh, you know a, a, an executive in all of the companies that he worked in and watching how he was a leader in my family and extended family, I think naturally felt like something I could step into. And I, and I do think that there, there, there is something just about how she's, I just think she's on the page. I think really, I, I want to really respect how the writers have written this woman and her authority and power. Um, so yeah, that's that's how I'd say I found her voice. I think it was given to me and I think a little bit from my pops, but yeah. I mean, watching it, there's a definite kind of maturity to the character also. And the thing about like these kinds of figures, I think, is that uh, really in some ways you kind of have to underperform them. You can't really make big cartoonish actions. You're playing someone who is a, basically a military person. So you kind of have to be very rigid, very stiff. So yeah. again, you can't really swing your arms around and make all sorts of crazy facial expressions. You gotta be very grounded. Uh, yeah. So like, was that kind of experience that you were dealing with playing this character? totally but but you feel it in the the costume won't let you it won't let you be like that the boots won't let you run the mark <laughs> literally you're you're rooted you're still your your voice and your face are enough you know um so yeah I, I i do felt feel like the costume helped me realize that her authority is is in who she is not how she is you know and we should also talk about like the biggest star of the show. And I'm, I'm curious if you got to spend some time with her because you didn't do any scenes with her. But uh, how was Grudge the Cat? <laughs> I didn't even see her on set. Ah. Yeah. It's funny, though. I, I, I'm not going to be liked by saying this as I'm definitely not a cat person. My dad had a big cat phobia. So does my brother. So I even spoke to David about this. I was like, so how do you feel about cats? <laughs> and he was like I love him love him you know I didn't really have that much time with him. but you know when I got grudge I was like I love her love her so much she's a queen she's royalty I'm sure I'd love her if I met her um but you know I'm not necessarily sad because <laughs> I, I am a little afraid of cats and allergic so <laughs> okay I, I can understand that yeah that's, that's a good reason I guess not to be so close to the greatest star of all time um, no she is she is for sure so, you know, we can't go this far either without talking about, I think, one of the biggest surprises of season four of Discovery, mm -hmm. which was the very finale, where we saw Stacey Abrams pop up in a yeah. surprising role. Uh, so, uh, you know, tell us about working with Stacey, because you are doing a scene with her, uh, and it's still a big yeah. deal to have this kind of person on set. So just kind of, I guess, kind of walk me through the day here. Like, you know, you get on set, you know Stacey's coming. Uh, how is this day going? What's it like being around her and all of her people? I'd imagine she had, like, an entourage of some kind of security detail and things like that too, right? Well, I, maybe there was security that I didn't see but all I saw were like two one woman actually who was working closely with her was like in all of the trailers I got such a fright Matthew because I walked into here and I just thought oh, it's my time to go into here and as I walked in she was there on my right and I literally went oh my god <laughs> I was so oh I, I just was like I need to retake this first impression because <laughs> I was I wanted to be so cool calm and collected because she caught me by surprise I I was a bit of a child and then she laughed and she was like everyone on the set is getting so excited about seeing me you guys are the people I'm I'm on the Star Trek set you know she was so kind and so generous about being like you guys are the people I'm a fan of like I'm the big fan yeah I'm the one who gets to be on the set um so yeah that was that was her I I think a lot of us just wanted to like not fangirl too much so we were just just trying to be really calm and then you know I like so wanted to get a selfie with her but I just couldn't bring myself to ask <laughs> but there's a group shot of us so I'm just like school um but yeah from the jump you know we did a zoom reading with her which was lovely to meet her first there um and to when she was on set which was just a really glorious day it was a hard day because it was such a late night shoot um but yeah she was ever so kind and ever so like generous with her stories about how she's a star trek fan and how this came to to be and yeah it was great it was really great 
Uh, there's been a lot of complaints, a lot of internet discourse, because there always is, uh, in particular about this episode because of Stacey Abrams and how a lot of mm -hmm. folks are saying now Star Trek is blatantly taking a political stance by having Stacey on and by not having a conservative mm -hmm. person on. So I, I don't know if you've seen that kind of stuff happen online. I don't know if you pay attention to that discourse, but uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. Like, like what do you what do you think yeah. about having Stacey on this kind of a show? And, and I guess the folks saying, you know, we should have equal opportunity for the conservative side, too. Oh, I don't think, but that, that for me is saying that Star Trek is a purely American show, which for me is the ignorance behind that, right? Like she's just a person who is a Star Trek fan. She's an incredible, powerful black woman. And I think that is a beautiful statement to make as a potential president of earth that in and of itself, regardless of party side, um, I do find a beauty about what she had did in this previous election. And I think that power is, is glorious as well in helping people who have previously been, you know, oppressed voter wise. So I, I just think that there's merit in who she is, what she does, that I think is a beautiful thing to bring to a leader of anything. Um, but yeah, the Star Trek is a show for the world. So if then we have to have a republic inside, then we need to have what someone who's in power in the UK, someone who's in power in South Africa. Like it doesn't need to be like tit for tat like that. I personally don't think. Um, but yeah, I try. I try and stay out of <laughs> any negative because uh, there's a lot of negative anything about Discovery. So I just try and not even look or pay attention to it. To be honest. Which is going to make this next question really hard because I'm about to kind of drive that a little bit further. Huh? <laughs> oh. And generally, you know, Discovery already has a lot of fan backlash because it's kind of a very divisive show for some folks. You know, some folks don't yeah. like the quote unquote new Trek. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to be quite blunt about it, I think this season of Star Trek Discovery has been like the blackest version of Star Trek we've ever seen because you're mm -hmm. talking about there's, you know, majority of the lead cast is people of color. Um, yes. There's, you know, there was even complaints earlier in the season about how there's not enough white members on the bridge, which is silly. Um, and, you know, even the season finale of Discovery, it spoke about reparations, which is like a really interesting big thing and an unexpected kind of topic to discuss. Um, so, you know, I mean, this truly is going where no Star Trek show has gone before. And clearly it's not for everybody, especially the fans who think Star Trek has never been political, which is also not true. It has always been political in various yeah. ways. Um, yeah. So what do you think about this particular season of Discovery really kind of putting it under the lens of people of color? And why is there such a pushback against that? Oh, racism. <laughs> that's that's for answer, yeah. That's why, that's why there's a pushback. I, you know, I also find with these, from just even the writers, I don't find the, I don't find that there's a push for people of color. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's like a, a an agenda. I think that there's a lot of best person for the job, best when you think of if you're gonna put in a great cameo then you think of a great leader of earth that was the name you know i don't think that there's any hidden agenda to make it the blackest star trek show or anything like that at all at all i do think that there is an a asserted effort for diversity i think of all kinds of of um sexual orientation of like you know all of that and I think that's important because I think representation matters I will say it again and again um but there is there, there is just a I don't know like a a naturalness in how vast and different people are. The fact that I'm South African, I don't think they sought out General Ndoya to be, you know, South African. I think that she, she could have been British, quite frankly. I think she could have been Australian. I think she could have been uh, from Nigeria. What She could have been American. Why not? Um, she could have been first generation. Whatever it is, you know, I just, I think that there's, it's a, it's a pity to think that it's, some like masterminds behind the show that are like it'll definitely not be a white man or it'll definitely not be this or you know I think it's just how the cards have fallen but I think that there is definitely a consideration in diversity because representation matters and it's it's Star Trek and why not <laughs> Yeah, it feels kind of like that way, too, because, you know, there's other shows I really like to watch that are kind of pushing that that uh, not really it's not agenda. Cause it's not really an agenda, but it's really pushing and changing how we're looking at different things like sci fi, uh, horror films. I mean, you know, all the stuff Jordan Peele has done 
has been under mm -hmm. a very different lens of horror. Uh, we can look at one of my favorite shows on HBO, which was Lovecraft Country, and it's like taking all these yeah. like older kind of uh, you know sci-fi horror uh, that that era of those types of things, putting it all under the lens of like Afrofuturism and other stuff like that. Um, so it's really presenting things in such a different light that I don't think you know combined with a lot of the political stuff that it talks about, uh, it feels like people just maybe aren't ready for that yet in the mainstream, which is yeah. a shame also because yeah. we're, we're missing out on really not telling all of the stories that are out there. Absolutely. And there's no other way to make them ready, but to just do it anyway with them being up in arms. <laughs> Fair enough. Now, I heard a story on the Ready Room uh, from Jonathan Frakes about how Star Trek was actually going to be your last show ever. You were thinking about retiring from acting uh, and then your experience in Star Trek kind of changed things up. So I'd love to hear uh, a little bit about the story and what happened for you. What, what made you go from I'm done with this to being like, I can't wait to keep going with this. <laughs> I, I so feel like this story is funny to me because it feels like a, a typical case of broken telephone. Uh, what I had said to Jonathan was, you know, this was, it, I was not throw, I was not throwing in the towel. I wasn't putting my gloves up, but I definitely had been on a streak of just rejection after rejection. And I think I was giving it a bit of time, but I was really considering what life looks like if I were to come back to South Africa and, and um, I don't know, work for my brother's incredible advertising agency. Or, you know, I just was considering other options for the first time in my life where I was just like acting is my everything um, because that rejection period can be so, so, so toxic and horrible. But I'd never been like, this is the last chance. <laughs> this is the last audition I'm going to try for. So that's, that's not necessarily correct in that story. But being given the job definitely reinforced why I love acting and why I could never leave it for anything <laughs> outside of it, except to like maybe, you know, start a family and raise some kids for a while. But other than that, I'm an actor through and through. And I think... If any other job that I would consider and I, I love many things I love photography I love baking or whatever it is um, would give me some joy but it wouldn't make me feel like I'm living my purpose and my purpose is to be an actor so I've never gotten to the point that I'm like this is absolutely absolutely the last chance um, I think that's that's a bit of a stretch <laughs> of a thought yeah all right, well, I'm glad we set the record straight then, because I know that video is out there okay. circulating. It's like a few hundred thousand views now, so we got to make sure people know the yeah. truth about that one. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But, you know, on, on that same kind of note, I have heard from a lot of people that the set of Star Trek Discovery is like one of the best sets I've ever been on. And I'd say you've been really fortunate to have a lot of amazing sets to work on also. But, I mean, how did Discovery compare? I mean, was it one of the best, if not the best, you've worked on? Definitely, without a doubt, especially the AR wall. It, 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 there's nothing like it. it is, it's absolutely outstanding. It is incredible. I mean, I love the, the prison set was really cool. The one in Astoria that wasn't the real prison because of the detail. I was just like, this is wild. Um, but no, Discovery takes it hands down. <laughs> Well, now that you mentioned that AR wall, you got to tell me a little bit more about that because uh, I wasn't even sure if you got to work with that or not. So yeah, tell me about the AR wall. I sure did. We did that with Stacy and, and a couple of other scenes of mine. It's humongous. It's humongous. And it's it, it just, the, it, so the one thing about it that takes some getting used to is because everything is kind of projected like, I want to say 360, but not really when the camera is on you and it moves the screens move the environment so that the camera is you know seeing what it would see and as an actor who's standing still and watching your world shift it it can be like it can make you feel a little nauseous and a little dizzy so that took some getting used to for sure because I was like what is happening it's just so large and when it starts moving it's <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little much um but it's also really cool once you get used to it you're like this is epic um so yeah it was it was a lot of fun it was a first for me and i i hope to do some sort of show that would put me in one again it's cool so here we are now it's not too long after season four has wrapped up but i'm curious what's next for you i know i know right now you're home in south africa but what's next for yeah. for me <sighs> You and God know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There's, you know, it's it's the general actor thing. We're, we're here, we're hustling, we're auditioning. So I'm sure there's something very exciting that you'll find out soon in the pipelines.
<laughs> All right, we'll leave it at that for now. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious too. Uh, I, I don't think you've probably done a Star Trek convention yet, have you? I haven't. No, I haven't. But I, I am repped by a great convention agency that I'm sure I might be popping out to something. I think actually there's something in August. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll keep our eyes but... open. So yeah, I mean, because that, that's like the big thing you got to start doing now. So if you're part of this world, you got to start doing the conventions because I know the fans are going to want to meet General Ndoye. I hope so. And I'd love to meet them. I was speaking to someone on Twitter who said they wanted to do a co cosplay, cosplay, I don't even know how to pronounce it, <laughs> of, of my character. And I said, please send me pictures. That would be so cool to see. So, you know, as we wrap things up here, uh, I'd like to ask you the question that I always end these episodes with too. And that's, uh, Pumi, what is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? That is a great question. Um... I think it's the community. I think the Star Trek community, as much as sometimes it can be conflicting and people won't agree on certain things, but the fact that it's so humongous and so attentive is, is really incredible. It feels like joining an, an empire. And I think one thing I've learned about, you know, the, the world of Star Trek and being in space is like how your imagination gets to like really breathe in so many different concepts and, and ideologies and so much that our humanity actually can rely on in terms of what we dream and hope for the future. And to, to know that my character and I got to be a part of that in some way or shape or form is, is truly inspiring and that it's going to last so long and that it's, yeah, it's part of the community that goes has been and will be for many years to come. I think that's that's the coolest thing for me. That's a great answer. And yeah, Pumi, it's been really great to talk to you. I'm glad we got to connect. Uh, I know, you know, for me right now, it's, you know, basically six hours. You're, you're actually living in the future, literally. You're six hours ahead of where I am right now. I am. <laughs> I am. I am. It was so great speaking to you as well, Matthew. Yeah, I appreciate it so much. And, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that Nadoya does come back. We'll see her again in more Discovery. If not, maybe we'll see you in some other way in the Star Trek universe. We'll see how things go. But, uh, you know, for sure, I know it's still fairly early in your performing career. And I look forward to talking to you again 10, 20 years from now when you've got your, your IMDb page even more robust than it already is. So uh, thank you so much. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much, Matthew. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today.